Hello and welcome back to Zim Explorer. I'm Dr. Abstract and in this Zim Explorer we're going to take a look through multi-user VR with Zim and Zim Texture Active, 3JS and Zim Socket. Oh, ah, how exciting is that? Unbelievable. Okay. So, uh, we are not in VR at the moment. That's a little hard to record at the same time as talk to you and look through code. But this is the app right here. It's called MultiPixel. So this is uh, zimjs.com slash multipixel. And it's a big pixel board like that. When you go in VR, it's like, oh, it's such a tall room. When you're in VR, you have a little avatar here and you see each other's avatars. And when you're not in VR, you see each other's avatars too, but when you're not in VR, you don't have an avatar yourself. You only see avatars of people in VR and they all zip around and look at you with a little, <laughs> little slot. They're, they're these spheres and you can color those spheres as well. The idea anyway is this is a pixel board so I can uh, sign my name here or whatever it may be. Can I sign my name? I wonder if I can. There's the letter D and here's an, oh, <laughs> missed. Need, need an undo or something like that. That's a little R and a, a little green leg. Well, I don't know. Here, does it have to be a fat green leg like that? And, and then my R is not high enough. I'll go, we'll go there. It just gets, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so anyway, we've been doing this uh, with friends, making, making pixels. There we go, Dr. Abstract, not bad. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to go quite as high. I don't know, what do you think? No, I did like it the other way around. Um, so uh, we've been playing and making castles and flags and stuff like that. It's fun. And oops, <laughs> broken Dr. Abstract. Okay, my, my cursor is so big I can't quite tell sometimes where I'm pressing. It's not not my fault. It's not. It's it's your fault. We, we've got this big cursor for you guys to see the cursor more easily. Anyway, this is multi-user. So if we copy this and go on over and try another version here, then we're in uh, multi-pixel and there it is. And so uh, let's add some white stuff, a little white line, white lines. There we go. And white lines on that one as well. So oh, can you tell? There we go. Two of them. Um, <clears throat> what happens when you go in VR is this color picker goes on the left hand, left controller, and the multi-pixel goes on the right controller and sort of stays at your hands. And you get a laser and you can point the laser at here. And like I said, you get a little avatar. So let's take a look at the code. There's a fair bit of code because what we're doing is Zim Texture Actives. Uh, so this is a texture active, this is a texture active and this is texture active uh, which is a way that we can put the zim 2d world onto surfaces in 3js so we're inside of 3js actually the background here is also a texture active we can ch check that out with the t so the t key uh, gives us the texture actives and we can use this little slider or, or slide like that there's our avatar we we do get an avatar or prepare an avatar even though we don't we don't see it when we're in, not in VR, but uh, this basically wraps on a sphere and makes a little eye and a, a stripe around the top. Here's the backing. That's the backing that's made. Here's the pixel thing. And this pixel should show already what we got, but it, it goes down so far that we can't see it. Um, but it is a live pixel board. So for instance, we'll do uh, whatever, some Morse code up top here. So you see that orange stuff? And then this was the selector there, uh, color picker. So now I hit the T key and I come back. Note that we're on the orange. And if we look up, there's, so that, that was all live. It's just, it went down so far, it went off the screen down, uh, which is interesting. I wonder if I should put a, um, a vertical scroll on that. That would make sense. Having run across that before, usually uh, uh, we could very quickly fix that. Um, just by making the height of the canvas at least as high as that. It wouldn't really change anything at all. So that might be something we can look at when we get into the code. You get it? So when we make the height of the canvas, here it is right there. This is the canvas and uh, Texture Active will tile all of your stuff uh, like that. Um, but 
it, if it's too high, I guess it doesn't make it scroll vertically. Never, never thought of it. We hadn't run into that problem before. <laughs> we made this pixel board so big. Uh, the other thing we could have done is made the pixel board smaller too. The, the size of this stuff doesn't actually really matter. It all gets uh, mapped as vectors anyway. So uh, like I said, it doesn't matter. Anyway, hit the T key. We've done bubblings. We've done bubblings and explore videos on texture actives quite in depth. So we don't really need to talk too much about the texture actives in this one. We have done a bubbling video, I think, on VR, and that was a puzzle. Uh, so we had a puzzle in VR and went through how to do that, and that was quite in depth too. So we'll see the VR again. This will be only our second video about VR, so we may as well still you know, describe what's happening there. Um, but what's new here is sockets as well, and I probably we've done some bubblings way in the past on sockets. Uh, sockets, I remember, I remember those. Uh, but um, we're going to see it again here in VR as well. Uh, so, like I said, a fair bit of code. Let's go take a look. Here it is. And this is called Multipixel, zimjs.com slash Multipixel. We're bringing in socket IO right there. And then we're importing Zim3 and importing Zim socket, which gives us the socket helper that works with socket IO. <coughs> uh, bringing in a font. And when our frame is ready, here's some information about sockets. You basically go to this URL right here and request an ID. And that's our ID for this app. And if you ended up using that same ID, you'd mess up our, our data, possibly. <laughs> so it's sort of built on an honor system. We're running one Node.js server in the back, and uh, the data for uh, this multi-pixel is running with that ID. So if an ID already exists, then you choose another one. And also, if you're using sockets for you know hundreds of people and stuff like that, you should get your own. Socket server. Uh, Zim, Zim's got a Zim server, which is Node.js based. And you can grab that code from Zim Socket. So Zim Socket is available here. Let me show you. So you go to the Zim under code and then libraries. There's Zim Socket right there. And this is a multi user experience. If I select those words like that, and we copy this into a new window here. Uh, you see how, uh, sorry. See how the pink is selected? Now if I select in here, um, oh, something broke. I'm selecting the wrong, I have to select this paragraph. So you have to select the paragraph that is the example. <laughs> this is not the example. Um, so uh, there is that selected. And if another person came in, they would get a different color. So every time that changed. <laughs> okay. So anyway, there's out there. There's other ones as well. There's a collective coloring egg. There's avatar based ones, which will be similar to what we're doing. So we're basically doing an avatar example. The documents for this, they're available at the Zim Docs right here. And then we go socket, socket, like so. And it describes how we have to import the socket IO and Zim Socket. We've got an overview. There's the site that we were just at and some examples. There's examples in here too. And as a matter of fact, this last example we've just added. So imagine that we have a tile with a thousand colored pixels, which we do, pixels. We do not want to send the full data for every change. So we send each person's individual change to be collected and adjusted live. So in other words, when I change a pixel, I send the data only for that pixel, not a thousand pixels of, of data, because that's just a fair bit of data and we don't need it. However, it does create a problem when somebody comes in, they won't know what the previous pixels are. So we scratched our head and just uh, did an update to ZimSocket to include what is called a master. So how that works is something like this. Um, if somebody else is joining, then then, then everybody else, so like say a new person comes in, we'll call them Peter comes in. 
I, if I'm already there in, in the room, so to speak, then I would get this, hey, another person has just joined and I get their data and that data will give me an ID. So if I ask for the data's ID, that's Peter's ID. So if I'm the socket master, so one person in the room is always a socket master. And if that person leaves, then Zim socket in behind assigns a different person to be the socket master until there's no people. <laughs> And then if you're the first person there, then you're the socket master. So that's how the socket master works. Um, so if I'm the socket master, then what I do is I loop through all of my tile colors. So remember, we haven't been sending the data for everything, but as, as everybody keeps adding pixels, that pixel data comes to me, and therefore I can keep a whole array of those thousands of pixels uh, and what their colors are. So here I am looping through um, a tile that has all those colors. In the end, actually, maybe we should adjust this, it doesn't matter too much. In the end, for VR on the Quest headset, a tile of a thousand colors wasn't the most performant. So we ended up just doing a single uh, shape and we kept an array of the data and when people draw in the shape we just drew a little rectangle in that single shape and that was much better than it. it's just like any other panel or something like that so uh, we might want to come in and adjust that to the shape version it really doesn't take too much more code the tile is a little bit easier but anyway we looped through the tile and got each color of the item and then we set the colors property to an array of those colors there. Oh, and note that when we did get the colors, we converted them to an index. So we say, hey, it's a green color. So what we're pushing into that colors array right there is um, C right here, index of green. So the index of green would be, well, why did I pick green? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Okay, so that would push the number 10 into colors. And any other um, pixel colors that we had, we would uh, do the same thing. And then we would send that data only once off to everybody. The thing is, not everybody needs it. So that's why we passed along as well the ID of whoever just joined. So remember, I rec I'm here and I see, oh, Peter has just joined and I'm the master. So basically I'm saying, I'm gonna send these colors to Peter, but everybody receives this message. And we don't want everybody setting their colors again because most all the people that were there already have the colors, so there's no need for them to reset their colors. Then the trick is, and, and sockets are tricky like this. This is all in the same code, just <laughs> right underneath here. Hey, socket not on data. So if we're receiving data, we'll, uh, we'll get this if there's colors. Oh, 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 somebody sent a whole bunch of colors. There, that's what it's called, colors. And d.colors.id, so uh, this is the name of it that comes in, d.colors.id would get whatever, you know, Peter's ID. So if d.colors.id is equal to my ID, because now, now I'm Peter, <laughs> so if I'm Peter, I get some data. Oh, you know, I've just joined. I'm just joined. Hey, oh, I got some data already. Hey, and this says I've got, there's a bunch of colors that have been sent to me. And if, if it says Peter's ID, that's my ID. Oh, then I'm going to loop through those colors and make the tile or make the tiles. I would have made the tile up above and all of the colors would be set to the colors in the array, kind of in reverse there. Okay, and we update the stage if we needed to. So isn't that neat? It comes in and other people, if they're not Peter, they don't bother doing this. Only if my ID matches the, uh, the ID that said, you know, I just joined, will I do the colors. Okay, so that's like a nuance, I guess. That was tricky to kind of figure that out um, so that we don't have to keep passing a thousand colors every time somebody um, does a pixel. All right, it probably handle it, but it's just not the most pleasant of data. Um, so there you go. 
All right. Good. Okay. So sockets have a couple methods that we can use. We may as well look at those while we're here. One is mm, that we'll be using anyway is set property right there. If we want to set just our own property, say our avatar has moved in its X. Well, it's a bad one because it would move in X and Y and therefore we would use set properties. <laughs> okay, we could set a property quote X and put the value. But if we have more than one property to set, then it would be set properties, plural. And uh, then it would be a squiggly bracket. So squiggly bracket X is 100, Y is 1000. Along those lines, usually X and Y data it has a lot of decimals. And so it's best to round those. Uh, if it's just X and Y, we can go to the nearest pixel. It's, it's fine. Um, I was also capturing um, rotation and stuff and rotations in, in <clears throat> radian. So be careful. Don't, uh, don't round a radian. That would make it for bad news, but you can round a couple decimals. So we use decimals, zim decimals, it's called. Zim decimals, you put the value in there, comma three or whatever, and that would round it to three decimal places. Uh, anyway, that saves data as well. You don't have to, like I said, it can handle it. It's just that's a lot of decimals sending back and forth over the sockets when you really don't need that fidelity. Ooh, do you like that? Fidelity. So that's when you set properties. When you get properties, you often are in the data event and just ask the data for what properties got sent. But you can get uh, different data in different ways like that. You can also get the latest um, data or, you know, what what was the latest data for th this, this uh, value. And that's sometimes handy for like a shared cursor or something like that. We're not using it in this case. There is a history and we thought about trying to set the history in some way that wasn't setting the data every time. So the, the idea behind the history is you store the history and when somebody comes in, then you receive the information from the history. That's perfect for chats, for instance. When you come into a chat, you don't want just, hey, what have you guys been talking about? You know, you wanna see the previous chats. That's what the history is for. But the history is sent every time um, you make a change to the history. Therefore, it really doesn't work with a thousand pixels. So we don't want to, it, it, if we didn't care, then yeah, we just put the thousand pixels in the history. And when somebody comes in, they say, okay, what are the thousand pixels? And it would tell them. So that would be how to do it. It's just, we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to send those thousand pixels. Okay. Or at least not all the time. There you go. We also have how many people are in the room, uh, and that is the size. It's sort of an odd one. Where the heck is the size here? <laughs> right at the end. Size. So that's what they tend to call it in socket I/O. So we don't really like that, the size of the socket. But that's how many people are in there. So it's not really the size. It's, uh, I mean, it could be, I suppose, but uh, be number or people or. Uh, something like that. <laughs> anyway, size is what it is. And we can grab the size if, if we need to. There's some events. There's when uh, the socket's ready, when we receive data from other people, when other people join, when other people leave, and when we disconnect. So those are the ones that we that we've been using. Uh, note that when you send data, you don't receive your own data. So, um, and number of people in the room, I can't remember how that works. I think that's how many people are in the room, not including you. Okay, so what happens is this. It assumes that you know your own data and it just basically never sends your, your own data to yourself or tells you that your own data or even tells you that it counts you as a number in the room, although could could have. So um, that's something to keep track of. Uh, the only time it does that is the latest data. You can, your data might be the latest data and, and it reports your data as latest data if it is indeed the latest data. All right, I think that's enough blah, 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 blah there on sockets, but it's good to give you that quick uh, reminder overview of sockets probably as we're about to go into sockets here. So when we're ready, we're gonna start our stuff. We have some, uh, lots of comments about, uh, we, we put 
for all the texture actives and a few other things we have and the VR stuff, the controllers, etc. We've put the parameters for that right, right in here so you can have a look at them nice and easily. But we're now in Zim and we're going through, we're gonna make our logo, our pixels, which is that big board, our color picker, our avatar, which is a round ball, uh, although it's really just a square, um, a square pattern that we're using there, and then the backing. So these are all texture actives that we're going to be making. And then we'll make those same things again in 3JS and apply the texture actives to them. So here's the logo. In this case, we're making the label first so that we know how big to make the logo. It's just gonna be based on the size plus a little bit more. That was some styling to, to really add a lot of uh, padding in the horizontal there to that logo. I don't know, do you remember it? There it is. Yeah, it's not that much, but there's our extra padding on the right, whereas there's less padding on the top and the bottom. Whoosh. Remember, this is as well made kind, kind of big. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't, didn't really have to be made, made that big. I'm not sure why, why we did. But uh, we'll, we'll get good resolution out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we do. Looks quite nice. Back to the code. Code, where'd you go? Code. And there we are. This is our texture active called logo. And we're centering the label on logo. Moving it a touch. Here we are making the board. We've put in, uh, it's going to be 1,500. Is that what that is? Yeah, um, 1,500 pixels. It's a texture active. It'll be that big. We have some white white space around the edge or the margin that we've declared there. And we had used a tile, but it bogged on Quest 2. It was fine on PC VR. Um, but here's us now dealing with it more manually, although we do have this thing called a hit test grid, which helps helps uh, figure out where our cursor is and which uh, pixel we're on. So this is basic Zim stuff, I guess. I don't know how much you want us to go over that, but uh, there's our array of colors that we would pass on when we need to. Here we are looping and we're putting nothing in a color. So we've got a bunch of zeros. So remember our colors are going to be the index numbers of, of the colors. And then we're making a shape of the right size we're drawing a rectangle into that shape and locating it in pixels. So remember, we need to add that to the texture active here, pixels. <clears throat> when we mouse down on the tile, we're asking, uh, we're, we're doing a tile hit test grid. We, uh, here are the parameters for hit test grid. This is a very efficient way of doing pixel drawing. It's an equation based thing. So you put in, hey, how big is your, your overall thing? Uh, how many calls and rows do you want or does it have? Where is the X and Y? So we're just using the frames mouse X and mouse Y. That's all mapped through the texture actives into CreateJS and up into Zim just as if it were a mouse. So the controllers are mapped right into Zim as a mouse and it's just like, oh, cool. So we don't even have to think about it. That's how we would have done it in Zim as well. And then off some offset and some spacing. Uh, then we have the type right here. Uh, and we've set an array. If, if it's an array, then it will return an array of index, call, and row. If we say calls, it would have been that. If we say rows, it would have been that. If it was uh, default is index, and it just says, here's the index number. We want, actually, just to make it easier on us, we want all three of these. So let's, uh, if, if we get something, uh, be careful. If you click in between the spacings, it won't return an index or won't return data. So sometimes uh, it will return the mouse down, but there's no data because you've just pressed inside in between the cracks of something uh, or along the edge of something. So always check to see if we got something there. And if we did, then we're going to find out what our color picker color is. So that's down here. There's our color picker. And 
whenever we press on the color picker, it now knows what the selected color is. So we're setting that to the color there, or vice versa. And we're then assigning the data to index call and row. That's a new ES6, whatever that's called. And then we're filling the tiles. We're, we're drawing a rectangle at the call and row from there times the size. And we're going to make it as big as the size. And we're filling it based on the color. We're also adding to the tile colors array at the index. So that's why we need the call and row. We could have figured this out, but it's just easier to collect it if, since, you know, since we can. Um, this is easier with call and row. This is easier with index. So we just collected all three. Otherwise, we could have calculated. And then we're uh, passing in the index of that color. So that's going to be whatever it is on the colors, which presumably is up here somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. It may, it may be down below uh, because this is on a mouse down, so that happens later. There's our colors, yeah. Okay, so like I said, that's just normal coding stuff, although we are using Zim to grab the hit test grid, which is handy. And then we tell everybody, hey, we just changed a color. So this is telling everybody, set a property called tile and pass it, we found that we needed it on the other side as well, so we passed it the data that we had, plus the color. So we're going to receive the, uh, the data down, down in here when we do our socket data, right here. So socket.onData, we collect D. If D is tile, that's our color, then we're setting uh, the tiles fill to d.tile.color. So this is why we, we've done it this way. We could have set, sent all three or all four of those as properties rather than an object literal. But this just allows us to nice and tidily say, oh, we've just received a tile. Let's do this stuff with it. Otherwise, we've received a tile, and then we've got these loose variables that might interfere with other things that we were collecting down below. So data is like there's one data event. Every th everything that we want to send, hey, if I send my avatar color, you know, I'm going to have to deal with it inside here. So we sort of want that as almost like a command. And then if we have a bunch of data for this command, we can uh, split it up from there. Okay, so there's us recreating the tile, uh, the tile color change on somebody else's computer. If you think about it, that wasn't too bad, was it? I mean, when we set it, we tell everybody else. Oh, that's everybody else doing something else there. Where did we set it? Right here. So we tell everybody else. Here's our color change at that at that data. And then everybody else, when they, uh, they'll receive a data that's called tile, and then we change the color of the, their, their tiles right there. Amazing. So we have multi-user multi tiles with Zim sockets. Um, I think you'll find that sockets are very tricky. There's more to it, as, as we're going to see here as people arrive and leave and other things that we need to do. But in general, Zim really simplifies sockets. Most socket servers and socket stuff has a whole bunch of stuff on the server side. So you've got to go into Node.js on the server, or it used to be you'd have to go into Java on the server, and nobody really wants to code in Java. So that's why we, um, that's why we built Zim socket so that all of it happens on the client. We actually built this back in Flash using PHP sockets and then Java sockets. Um, and then, then we updated it to Node.js sockets. And then when we started Zim, we brought, brought all that over and called it Zim sockets. So that is very, very complicated code. Very, very, very complicated code to do something very simple. When you set a property, you send it off, everybody else receives that change. <laughs> I mean, what's, what's, <laughs> oh, why does it have to be harder than that? And yet in behind is extremely tricky code in two different places. There's Zim socket that helps 
the sort of local stuff happen. And then there's also the Zim socket server, which is Node.js based, which, and both of those are relatively complicated code. We're talking like, I don't know, 500 lines of code, each of them, of uh, tricky stuff, just to make it simple. Interesting, huh? Okay, so, um, boop, 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 boop. That was our tile that I mouse down, great. And now we come to the color picker. Here's all the color picker stuff. We've added it to the colors texture active right there. And I don't even think we have an event. Uh, there, there, there's no need for a change event on that color picker because we're just setting the color at that point and then we're poking on something else. So it's when we poke on something else that we do all the stuff. Here's the body. The body does get poked on. So the body is a texture active, 500 by 500. Uh, we're randomly getting a skin color and we're making sure that it's not the same color. We're then checking local storage. So you'll find that if you save it, well, even if you don't save it, you'll come back with the same avatar color. Uh, but if you then change your avatar color, that writes to local storage. So there's some local storage work. Here's the skin, which is a colored rectangle over top of that, 500 by 500, and skin dot on mouse down, change color. We've got a stripe on that, which is a thinner thing, and stripe dot on mouse down, probably put that belly underneath it there, stripe dot on mouse down, change color, and then we added a little belly that is the same color as the stripe thing. You can't actually click on your belly, it's too, too low, you can't really see it, you're up above it. So, uh, we just made the belly, which is this little, it's a square dot, but on a, on a sphere, it looks like more of a mouth, which is fine. We, we could have made it 25 here. Uh, let's see, it would be 25 in the width because it's being stretched on the, on the belly and then 50 on the height, roughly. I don't know if that's the exact answer, but then it would be look more like a square. I should actually check that out, make sure that we don't want that, but it's fine as a little slot, almost looks like a slot, horizontal slot, that is. Okay, so change color is right here. That's being called if we press on either of those two things. And we're going to use the e.target to figure out which one we pressed on and change the e.target's color to whatever the picker's selected color is. We store that in local storage, but we also tell everybody else that we just changed either our skin color or our stripe color. We're piggybacking those together. So that's a set properties, and we just passed both of them at the same time. We could have passed only one and treated it as a one-time thing, but <clears throat> uh, this'll be fine. Okay, so uh, that's us sending that along. And then down below, and when we collect our data here, uh, doot, 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 avatar info. If there's some skin being passed along, then we know that there's also going to be a stripe. So we're just checking to see if, um, if the data includes skin. If it does, we set the avatars Whichever avatar passed this, that, that's d.id is whoever sent the ID. It's the socket ID of whoever sent this. And we're going to see how we set up our avatars in just a sec. But uh, basically, it's an object literal that stores everybody's avatar there. And so we get it at the ID, change the skin's color to whatever the data set. And same with the stripe and the belly. So more on that avatars later, we're, we're, we're getting to that soon. Who knows, <laughs> might be actually the next thing, I don't know. But uh, that's the skin stuff. Then we had a backing and the backings, the stripes and the texture active. Once again, we didn't use a tile in this case because uh, tiles in VR, tile, uh, sorry, not a tile. We didn't use a tile, but we also didn't use pizzazz patterns. Pizzazz in our 2D world, usually we use pizzazz for those patterns, but those patterns are actually made out of rectangles. And that's so that it can be easily animated and dealt with if needed as rectangle. But um, in VR, it's probably better to have just a single shape rather than a bunch of rectangles, which are a bunch of shapes. So we 
And it's quite simple to do. It's a little bit of extra work working in a shape here where the pattern would have been make a new pattern that that's stripes period <laughs> anyway whatever okay so here we are in the sockets and we're going to have the uh, the avatar up here so any when anybody in vr when anybody is in vr an avatar will be made and we want that avatar represented in each of whoever's you know viewing this so we're going to store those in an object literal called avatars. And when we receive some socket data, basically how it works is uh, right here. If we've received an avatar data, so as soon as an avatar is made, it's actually down here. So once our XR controllers have connected, that means, oh, we're in, we're in VR now. Uh, basically, once we're in VR, we send this to the sockets. Hey, we have an avatar. And we're going to receive the socket ID here. <clears throat> we could have just put true there. That's fine. Because when we received an avatar data, by default, we'll also get the ID uh, of whoever sent that. But whatever, so we've got an avatar with an ID there. Oh, we actually use the list of avatars. Yeah, so it's important to have an array of IDs. And that's because if somebody comes in after all these avatars are made, it's really easy to say, hey, socket, get properties called avatar. And what it'll do is it'll be given a list and that list will be the list of values. So if we just said true here, it would be a list of true, 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 which wouldn't be helpful. So we've stored the socket ID there, and then we get socket ID, socket ID, socket ID, socket ID, and that's a little more helpful. Actually, I just kind of thought of something, though. <laughs> we could have, there's a get property IDs, and that would, and av of avatars, and that would have gotten the IDs of everybody who stored an avatar's property. <laughs> Oh, well, whatever. Uh, either, either way is fine, I suppose. So we're also sending the skin color, stripe color, as well as an X and Y, or X and Z. We're, we're working with X and Z because we're on the horizontal plane, which is X going sideways and Z going in and out of the screen, whereas Y is going up and down. So it's a little bit different than working in our 2D X and Y. But uh, there we are, X and Z, and also rotational values, although as we create that at the beginning it's probably obvious we might come back to that in just a sec once we see where we where we got this dolly from and so forth um okay so that's what we're doing when we create an avatar we send that out so if we come back up here to our data there's our data we're saying hey if somebody sent an avatar that means it's just started and if we don't already have that avatar in our object literal. So if that at the ID doesn't exist, then we're going to make an other avatar and pass it that ID. Shall we have a look at that? So down below here we are making somebody else's avatar. So this is us, we're already in VR and somebody else has joined and we want to see their avatar. So we're going to get whatever, whoever that ID is, we get all their, all their data. So that will get all of their socket data. And uh, where do we use that? It's the letter D. That will get its skin color, its stripe color, and some other things, maybe uh, X and Y's, or X and Z's, and rotations. Okay, so uh, that gets whatever data they have, yay. <coughs> Excuse me. We're adding to the avatars at the ID a new texture active. So in other words, what we're storing in that avatars object is uh, at the ID, that is, is a texture active object. That's not interactive. It is animated because it might change color, but it's not, it's not um, needing to be interactive. So we've set that. We then have to create the skin, which is a rectangle, and we're adding it to that texture active. 
we have to create the stripe and the belly. We're use, using that data to get the colors. So basically we're doing the same thing that we did to get our own avatar. As a matter of fact, we might have somehow at, just made this make avatar and made it so that it could make our own or somebody else's, but really it's about that much. So we're repeating that much. Then we want to add it to the texture actives, which we haven't seen yet, but we're going to add our texture active that we just made, dynamically add it to the texture actives after the texture actives has already been made, which is the first time that we actually tested this in, in real. Uh, we had, and all the other examples in, in 3JS with texture actives, we made the texture actives and then added everything uh, right to the texture actives. For instance, down here, we, we did that a bit here. Here's the texture actives. And note, we're live adding the logo, avatar, backing, pixels, colors. So there it is added to the start. That's what we did for all of them. But now we're also dynamically adding more of these as different avatars. That's our own avatar. But as different avatars come in, we're dynamically adding texture actives to the texture active list, uh, which is this thing. So if I go T like that, I see one texture, one uh, avatar there. But if I go to another place here, that. I'm not actually sure. So I've just, oh, I uh, can't remember if this, uh, this doesn't add an avatar unless it's in VR. Yeah. So we're not going to see it, which is too bad. But basically what would happen is if somebody else came in in VR, they would get a texture active like this as well. And it would be tacked on the end basically. So all the new people will get texture actives added. As, as people leave VR, those texture actives get removed from texture actives and then disposed. Okay. So sorry, I can't show you that, but that's all right. Okay, how are you doing out there? Remember, if this gets too long for you, you're always welcome to take a pause and go grab a cookie or some fruit, uh, some frozen blueberries, whatever it may be and then do a little stretching, come on back and have a listen to the end of this. Hopefully these explorers are useful for you because, uh, you know, we do spend some time doing them and we would love it if you came in and uh, like gave us a comment or a like or whatever, that would be nice as well. Or came in and joined us at zimjs.com slash slack and zimjs.com slash discord. Certainly if you have any, any questions, that's uh, where you should be. Okay, that's our brief interlude. Yay. <laughs> I, I need an interlude. <laughs> Where'd my brief inter interlude go? All right, so scrolling back up then. Do, do, do. I can't remember quite where we were. It's back up here somewhere though, I think. Make other avatars, right? Uh, so yeah, that's our avatar then. And when when a new when somebody comes in, they announce, "Hey, we got an avatar," and this will then make that avatar. This is when they change the skin, and we showed you that. And then here's when they move. So we haven't seen them moving yet. Just have to be a little bit careful because if we're testing dx, dx could be zero, and so we can't just say if dx like if skin. Uh, skin will never be zero. I know that's a color, but it would be quote number sign zero 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 or something like that. Then, actually, let's just think about that. The color, yeah, the, the the colors, the colors for the skin and the stripe are full colors. It was the colors in the uh, tile when we had a thousands of them that we went to an index number. But here we're just using the actual color. So we'll see how to do the X and Y soon. Let's see if we've missed anything else. No, I think that's good. Okay, let's go into the 3JS then. Bum, bum, bum. So, oh, we have the other join and the other leave and then the 3JS. Okay, well, let's, let's check those out. So when somebody else joins, we are running a timeout and saying, hey, if we are the socket master, so that's say I'm the socket master, after one second, set a property of colors 
and hey, we've seen this before. This was in the in the docks earlier. We didn't put the time out there, and maybe we should. We found uh, when we were testing that if you just refresh the page, then what happens is if you're the master and you refresh the page, it takes a little bit of time for the fact that the master just left and assigning a new master. And by the time I've refreshed, I'm not ready. Uh, there's no other master made. So we were we were dropping some data sometimes. It didn't happen all the time. It was intermittent, which is a pain in the neck. Uh, it's a little bit of a complicated system to figure out who the master is because you have to send off information to everybody and get information back. So there's a slight time delay in that. Anyway, we found that it just meant that we put in a timeout. Probably doesn't even have to be a, a minute. <laughs> well, that's not a minute, a second, sorry. Uh, we could probably have done that with a 0.5 seconds. But anyway, just to be safe, it's a second. And that means that as people come in, this is what you see. So if I copy this, there's the data there. If I copy this to here. You get a second delay before uh, before that stuff pops in. After that, your full like it happens right away. You don't see that? Let's see. I have to press on this one here. Okay. So even though this is local, it's actually going out to Zim Socket. Oh, you couldn't see those ones because we were off the screen there. So yeah, it's pretty fast, huh? So this is what it would look like basically around the world, <coughs> which is nice. Um, aside from what I just drew, <laughs> yeah, well. Closing that, and coming back to the code. So when somebody else joins, basically, if I'm the master, I'm responsible for setting, uh, passing in the the array, the tile colors array. Luckily, I already have the tiles color array. Remember up here in the in the data, if somebody sent me their specific tile color, look, I say tile colors. That's the array at whatever index that was, is equal to whatever color was sent. So everybody is storing their own version of this array. And as everybody else just sends one little bit of data, they add it to their own um, array, which is right up here. Tile colors. Okay, we start off with a bunch of black colors in there, but then um, as people add their own colors, they they get all added because of that right there, this, this guy right there. So now if I'm the master, basically what's happening, if I'm the master and somebody else has joined, if I'm the master, I'm responsible for sending them my tile array. So where do they see, receive that? They receive it under colors. So if we come up here, <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's our data. It's not tile. Here it is, colors. And when they receive that, it checks to see if it matches, if the new person joining that ID matches their ID. And if so, then we recreate, we loop through that array and we draw the color at that location. Note how we took the index. What do we do? Yeah, because it's just an index. We, we All we have is an array. So we take that index and we turn it into rows and calls there. So that's that calculation we mentioned that we were saving earlier, but we're, we can't save it here. So there's our calculation. And we're using those calls and rows to draw a rectangle at that location. So that's recreating the whole of the tile because the new person, the new person, the same ID that uh, arrived here, when somebody else joined, that's their data, that's their ID, we're sending whoever just joined, not our own ID, but whoever just joined along with that. So isn't it twisty? It's like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, that was a joining. When they leave, we're finding out which avatar they are, if they had an avatar. So check to see, because they might not be in VR, they might not have had an avatar. And then we need to remove that in a couple different ways there, which we haven't really seen most of this stuff right here yet, because that's down in the 3JS. But uh, we want to make sure that we delete our uh, delete that avatar from our things, otherwise bad things will happen. 
because we have stores that we have an avatar that doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so that's how you delete from an object literal like that. Cool. Now we turn to the 3JS. Yay! So here we are in 3JS. We're using the Zim 3 helper module. So that's how we can uh, create all that stuff. We have turned on texture actives and we've turned on VR or X. Sorry, it's true. <clears throat> so just watch that. We are storing local variables of those. We're making a floor. The floor is used when we teleport. So that was discussed in a previous bubbling, I think it was, uh, for the first VR bubbling. So have a look back over that too. We'll, we'll go over it a little bit here, but uh, maybe, you know, we're approaching an hour, so I don't want to go over all of the VR stuff again too closely. Uh, maybe we should, I don't know, whatever. See how it goes. So uh, the floor is down there. We have for non-VR, we're adding the orbit controls. Here's VR stuff. We're making XR controllers, passing in three. It's going to be a laser, and we've increased the line length. Uh, we're probably going to be fixing up the line length uh, so that it works automatically. Maybe it has a maximum line length, perhaps, that just floats around as a maximum. But then if it hits things, then we're going to shorten the line length, or at least that's the plan. Haven't done that yet. I think we'll probably work it out with ray casting, figure out how far something is and remake the line. Yeah, so it shouldn't be too hard to do. We might even put some sort of little uh, blotch on the end of the line if it's hitting it, sort of like that moves along the surface. I don't know. I've seen that kind of stuff before. But right now the line just points right through stuff. It's not the end of the world, but uh, could be could be better. <clears throat> And we found that we needed to shift things, so it looked it looks okay where we are coming in. That's not too bad. I mean, we could maybe shift to the camera, but here here's where you know, we're gonna lose all that if I refresh. So that's that's where we come in. But when you're in VR, you're kind of like it's right in your face. It's too close. We need to move back a bit to somewhere around here. So we just did a shift as we go into VR we um, shifted this amount in the Y, so we moved everything down, I guess. Uh, or is that up? I can't remember which way it goes. Uh, up is positive. Yeah, so. And, and then uh, shifted things back. <clears throat> oh, we don't need that anymore. And... So XR controllers, when we're connected, the reason I had that little thing I just deleted there is there's a question as to what should happen when we come out of VR. It leaves you in the browser, kind of broken. So we have to, we have to, VR puts the camera in a dolly, moves that around, puts some other things on your hands. And then when you come out of VR, you got to put all that back to where it was. And it ended up being a big list, if you want to see it. I guess I don't want to scare you or anything, but it was called this one, Full Exit. <laughs> uh, we kept it because it was a fair fair bit of work, and it was getting longer and longer as, as we needed to do things. Uh, so here here's when we disconnect. It was kind of like, uh, put everything back, turn this off, turn that off, and then there was a little, some, some tricks. The question is, Basically, when you go into VR, right in here, so this is us going into VR, we make some XR movement, and we make a teleport, but do we want to do it again? Probably not. You know, do we, so do we want, we, we need to either dispose these when we exit, and then we can make them again, or what I was doing there is just checking to see if we've made the XR controllers. So if, if we did already, then anyway, I ended up not going that route because it was, you know, some, some conditionals in here as well as a whole bunch of this stuff. It was kind of convenient because it put you right back in like VR, uh, sorry, uh, browser, and you could start playing with it again. 
the only trick it we got it working ev everywhere including other people's avatar like our avatar when it leaves and comes back and leaves and come back was working everywhere else it was all like tricky we had to reset things in here etc uh, <laughs> one thing that didn't get set is for some reason it was stretched horizontally when it came out of vr there's probably a way to figure out how to make it not stretch for uh, horizontally i don't know the whole world was stretched horizontally and it's kind of like okay i gotta go dig or dig around and find that and then we had a thought maybe it'd be better if we just refresh the page because then then it um, starts all over again which is fine the only drawback is it, it if you're the last person with the board it's sometimes handy to come out back into the browser where you can take a nice easy screenshot of what the board looked like so like kind of save your pixel drawings but uh, for all of this stuff, it just kind of wasn't worth it. So we, we just simply refresh the page now when you disconnect. Because otherwise, if you don't do that, you're left in a browser with the camera inside of a dolly. So you, the orbit controls don't work properly anymore because it's off inside of a dolly. Uh, your socket's still half there or not. You didn't, your avatar is kind of half there, but it, you know, it's, it's, no, it's not supposed to be there anymore because you're not in VR anymore. So it was just a mess unless you clean it up. So rather than clean it up, we ditched that and we just went, okay, let's let's make it simpler. It's already complicated enough. And that's what it becomes. Just reload the page, go to the same page when you disconnect and it resets it all just fine. So yay. Um, and we don't have to worry. We're, we know that this is only ever going to get made once, so we're fine. And this is only going to ever get made once, and we're only adding the events down here. We've got some uh, XR controller events. We don't have to clear those events because we're only adding them once. Yay! Uh, so it just made it all a little bit easier. All right, so what were we doing? Blah, 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 blah. We're adding movement. Ah, some changes to the movements based on some user testing with friends. Uh, one, we remembered that we liked being able to rotate not continuously. So you can rotate with the right hand stick by moving it left and right. It will rotate you clockwise or counterclockwise or whatever you want to call that. And we had had it so it just rotated sort of um, analog like it just you know just sort of you could see the angles would move and you just rotate but what we like better is when you can rotate by an angle so that would have been a 45 degree angle this is a 22 and a half degree angle <laughs> who's the lazy one um but anyway that that's better so every time you press the stick it rotates by a little bit of an angle 20 degrees or whatever and if you hold the stick down then it it rotates at a, a certain rate so we went in and we adjusted the XR movement so that it has a rotation angle. And so we're not using the rotation speed and it's also got a rotation interval, which is like half a second or something that you can adjust if you need to. Yay. So that's good. Um, basically we built, rebuilt our controls that we had in alt space, which were wonderful. They're better than VR chat controls in my mind anyway. In VR chat controls, you're stuck either moving or teleporting. You've got to switch over to another system to teleport. Uh, you know, jump or whatever. Uh, use a sort of poke a line and teleport to wherever that line goes. Also, it's a little bit annoying in VR chat when you poke that line, you, your whole thing just walks to that location. And I mean, that's okay. It, ke it keeps everybody's avatars uh, not moving around too quickly or jumping here and there. But in in uh, alt space, we would just jump to that location. It was much more convenient and totally everybody got used to it. It was just fine. So anyway, rebuilt the con all the controllers of alt space, just how I like them. And it's like, yay. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit hard coded, but there's some things in here in the XR movement that you can swap out like uh, the left hand controller it goes forward and backwards when you press forward and backwards so does the right hand but you don't have to you can make it go forward and backwards go up and down so that could be vertical strifing so that you're almost flying 
uh, we took that away. There's probably a better way to fly, and that would be just go to where you're looking. That's how we used to do it in alt space. You just push forward and look somewhere, and then you fly that direction. So look for that coming one day. Uh, that would be uh, a controller in here. Uh, whichever way you're looking, you could fly. Uh, but at the moment, it's not in there. However, you can still go up and down if you wanted to by setting a parameter in the XR movement. Right now, we're just, uh, in this example, we're on a horizontal plane. <clears throat> All right. Good. We also introduced, which <laughs> totally makes sense, we had been previously we had all our skyboxes were spheres and so we made a radius uh, of uh, right there a radius max so you couldn't go outside the skybox in a sense so like you'd go as far as your sphere and not further <laughs> we realized that a lot of rooms are square or rectangular or cubic or whatever you want to call it boxes so we didn't have a way to to have maxes maximums of that we had this sphere inside of a box which was a little awkward we couldn't get to the corners so we had to add a box max and so this is your left hand right hand left hand uh, whatever x y and z limits on that we don't care about our y limits we can't actually go up and down but uh those are there and we want something in those limits i'm not sure what would happen if we st stuck those to zero? We're at a certain height, so it just wasn't worth figuring out what height we're at. It's a uh, body height we're at. We pro probably could have just put body height, body height in here. <clears throat> All right, so uh, along those lines, we also realized that if you want to turn off movement here and just rotate it and vice versa, we I think we have it now set so... If you set a rotation angle of zero, no, sorry, a, ma a radius max of zero, then you'll just stay there and you can spin. And if you set a rotation speed or maybe angle, yeah, rotation angle of zero, then, oh, uh, I can't remember what that does. I think that makes it so you can't rotate. All right, so that, that's the way that you would block rotation, but get movement, which would be annoying. And there we are teleporting. So there's our floor that we passed in there. <clears throat> Here we are adjusting the board. So we're moving the board back and up or down or whichever way it was, I can't remember. There we are adding the left controller. So well, we already have a left controller, but this is adding this stuff to the left controller. So we're adding the color picker. We're, we're rotating it. We're making it smaller, much smaller. And then we're adding the XR controllers controller one adding the color picker very easy to do and all of a sudden this this interactive stuff the color picker is on the left hand controller it's like whoa okay that's pretty easy and then we put the title on the right and that title we're planning on making it options now that we have the rotation maybe we can let you change what angle each of the rotation is or if you want continuous rotation so this stuff can be set afterwards as properties and we could have put it in a settings panel on the uh, right hand controller. So when you press it or a little gear there, it would pop up more. To make it pop up more, it's quite easy to do. The logo right up at the very top, we would have to make it higher. So it would be much more than the label height. It would be a whole other panel up above. And then you can add things to that, uh, the logo texture active maybe rename it settings or something rather than logo and then you could just hide and show things in zim like we normally do remove from and add to or center or whatever position and that would just add it to the texture active and remove it from the texture active whenever you want and it would be this little panel that would pop up up above where whatever you had before so when you come back to this example perhaps that will be in there it was on our mind. And sorry for the long scroll. Like other avatars. We're doing okay. We're nearly there. <clears throat> Which is good because my voice is nearly gone. And where did we get to? Yeah, so that was adding to the right controller. XR controllers, controller two. I also tested it to see what it would look like 
up above the board, maybe that's where that is. I can't remember. Down below somewhere. So I, I tried moving it to another location. And didn't like it as much. Here's our dolly. So dolly holds our camera. So that's a reference to the dolly. The dolly now holds the camera in VR. And we are moving it up. So we're moving the position to the body height. Or whatever that was. Once we get here. Uh, yeah, so that just sort of shifts it. <clears throat> we then add the body to the scene. Why did we do that? Oh yeah, because we're in we're in VR now. So we had already made. You'll see down below we've made the body, but we don't add it until we come into VR. Putting the body in a dolly rotates it awkwardly. Yeah, we found that when we put the body in the dolly, it would have made sense to put it in the dolly and then we move around the dolly, the body goes with it. But when you turn, when you rotate, we couldn't seem to find the center within the dolly. It's like the dolly, I don't know what it was doing, but uh, it was just awkward. Maybe there's, you know, uh, it would have been pretty easy probably to figure that out, just put it in the dolly. But what we did instead is we left it in the in the scene and then we positioned it to the dolly's position in the three pre-render. So this is Zim's way to insert a function just before the in the render uh, in the render function. Okay, so as it's rendering there, just before it renders, there's also a post render. That's not bad. Uh, my friend did point out though that it does mean that the direction that the avatar is facing isn't based on the head it's actually just based on the dolly and, and you're spinning it but looking with your head back and forth doesn't move the little slot that's there that could be represent you know could be the eyes so there's probably a, a way to do that i'm not sure what the head is exactly if it's the camera or if it's it's not the dolly, but maybe it's the camera in the dolly. So maybe as you move your head, the camera is moving and we could have just anchored it to the camera. So that'd be really easy to figure out. Just, I could have taken this and added it to the camera. If you do add it to the camera, then remember to add the camera to the scene or whatever it is. Actually, the camera is added to the dolly and the dolly is in the scene, so that's good. Yeah, but um, just remember, anytime you add something to the camera, regardless of whether you're in... Uh, VR or not, and probably not in VR, uh, when you add something to the camera, make sure that the camera is added to the scene because the camera is not by default added to the scene. You won't see it anymore, like a HUD or something like that. Okay, here's our avatar. We talked about that. That's sending our avatar along with our dolly's position and the rotation. Ah, oh, right, we had a problem with the rotation. Rotation of the dolly is in quaternions or whatever it's called. And it goes, goes from negative 90 to 90 and then back again. So you're spinning right around. It's going negative 90 to 90 and then back to negative 90. It's like, what the fuck is going on? Who invented this system? There's, I don't know, gimbal lock avoiding or whatever the heck is going on. I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, if you get rotations, there, there's something like a lot of help saying things like, uh, oh, set the rotation order of your camera. Well, our camera is inside of a dolly, and so I tried that, but it's a VR camera. Or is it a VR camera? I can't remember. You know, it was just too far down. I, every, everything I tried didn't work. So I gave up on that because it sucks. So, I don't know, maybe somebody out there, if you know what you're, if you know what you're doing, let us know. But uh, as far as I could tell, that sucks. You know, it was like, oh, come on. Just tell us the rotation of this thing. How can it be so hard? Or somebody's got to have a nice, easy equation. And there wasn't really, there was, you know, setting up this Euler thing. And, and I tried all that. And I tried everybody's help stuff and none of it worked. So gave up and said, okay, I'm going to just keep my own rotation. So every time we rotate, which is done on the send position here, um, no, nope, it's done somewhere else. Oh, it's done right in, in the Zim 3 module. So what we've done is you can do the dolly rotation if you want, but as we're rotating in the XR movement, so in the XR movement up here, 
in this XR movement, we also store a rotation in degrees, 0 to 360. Actually, is it in radian? No, I think it's in degrees. Well, hang on, we'll check. No, it's it's in radians, but at least it's it's not in quaternions or whatever that is. Uh, so it's basically you go and get the user's data rotation y. There is no rotation any other rotation. We've just got the rotation y in there, which actually could come back to bite us. Maybe one day we want like the head or the, the dollies going up and down, rotating it, like a head nodding or something. We might want that around the x. But at the moment, um, or around the Z, but at the moment, we've got it just around the Y. So you're welcome to use that. And the thing is, we're sending that rotation out to everybody. We don't want a rotation that says from 90 to negative 90 when we're spinning right around because uh, it just doesn't work. It was stupid. The other person's avatars, you, you would be spinning right around and it would just go, be going back and forth, basically. And so we had to do something. And this was our solution. All right, let's move on. We are capturing the axes and the press down. And the reason for that is we're going to call send position there. Um, on the press down, that's a reset. So that's the thumbstick reset. And by default, uh, that doesn't have the added height. So we, we looked at that and said, oh gosh, we probably should have, if we're resetting the height, how, how do we know what the height that is? We're just resetting it to zero, but we're not at zero. So uh, anyway, once you reset it, we then uh, adjusted the dolly's position. And that's, oh, you know what? I think both of those would want to go in. So this is whenever we press down on anything. We don't need to set the body height all the time. So I think that could probably go in a, like so. I hope. I'm hitting my caps lock, not my tabs. Okay, so that's um, setting the position. We don't really collect the Y or do anything with the Y, so that's okay. We just had to reset it there, but we, we don't need to send it. So this is send position is being done when we do that and send position here. And here's in send position, we're setting the X, the Z, and the rotation again using the uh, our built-in rotation in the user data there. What are these numbers threes? What do they do? Oh, that's how many decimals we're putting that to. X and Y probably don't even need to be three. They could they could be rounded, probably even. But watch the rotation if it's in radians. Okay, so anytime we're using our controllers, we're sending everybody else our X and Z and rotation. That is so everybody else can move our avatars that they're that they're looking at in their headset or in their browser uh, they'll see our avatar move that's how it's done it's not it's not magic something has to happen we've got copies of these uh, you know there's an avatar a copy of an avatar object in everybody else's as well as ours so we have to tell those copies to move and here's how we do it with the set properties and then when those other people receive the data, we're getting farther away from this, aren't we? Uh, when other, I think I missed it. Other people receive the data, body, backing, data. All right, here's the data. Should put uh, one of these things next to it, I guess, a little bookmark. <clears throat> Some people separate this out into another file. I don't find it worth it. I mean, I could have gone to another file and found it really easily, but it's just other things are a pain in the neck, uh, scope and stuff you have to deal with. So here's us. And when we receive the X and Y, that's right here. So basically we're saying if we're getting some data on an X and Y, if, if nobody's moving, we don't get data X and Y. If all they're doing is setting a tile color, then we get the tile color. So the data only receives whatever was sent. And so if an X is sent, just be careful, that could have been zero. So that's why we're saying this is a tricky one because uh, null is not a number. 
Uh, so if this is null, is this still going? Anyway, I can't remember. I think that works out. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't. Maybe we're running, we're getting this all the time, no matter what data we're sending, because null, like dx would be null. And I think that's, perhaps this should just be if dx is not equal to null. Yeah, let's do that. That's safer. If dx is not equal to null, <laughs> told you I was hitting my caps lock. All right, that means we've got something in dx and it will be a number. No worries. All right. So if that's the case, then we are grabbing the body that belongs to the avatar of whoever sent the data. So some, somebody is sending this data, we get their ID, we look in our avatars for, um, that gets us a reference to the body that, or to the texture act, active that we made for that avatar down here. So remember when we made the other, uh, this is the texture active that is being stored in there. And that texture active has a body property right there. A is our texture active avatar. And then we said a.body is this body mesh right here. Okay, which we've added. <clears throat> there was the initial data for it, but now we're making a change to that. And so we gain, gain access to the body. We're setting the rotation. We're setting the position. And body height. That's why it doesn't move in the Y. And then if Right, uh, so there was that shift. So if we're in V, if we are in VR, we shift those bodies. If we're, n or no, if we're not in VR, we shifted them back. Yeah. Okay. So the people in VR, they've they've all been shifted. So if we're not in VR, then we need to shift them back. So that's a negative version of those shifts. Blah. <laughs> all right. Uh, we've done make other avatar. We're almost done. We just have to get to the texture active stuff. So we just set position. Yay. When we disconnect, we refresh the page. We saw that before. <clears throat> and finally, our texture active stuff. So we're adding those initial things to the texture active. These are each of the Zim things. Here's our board. Our board only has, uh, it has this canvas texture right here, which is, so that's a canvas texture. That's how we can put the canvas on a 3JS object. That doesn't make it interactive though. It just puts it there. So then we pass it the pixels, which is the texture actives canvas, not pixels. Pixels is a texture active object but pixels.canvas is the canvas of that. And then um, that gives us our, our texture. We're using that texture twice on the front and the back of the board. The other sides of that, of that box get just normal colors like that. All of this material then gets meshed to the board geometry right here. We add the board to the scene. We're repositioning it for people not in VR. We're uh, pushing it uh, up. And then we're setting it scale to be quite smaller. We are then adding the mesh, the board, that the, this is the mesh, to texture actives. So texture actives receives the texture active object called pixels. But once we make the mesh itself, right here, board, we also have to pass the board to the texture actives with add mesh. This is the layer it's on so that we don't raycast everything. And that matches the layer right here. That means that our texture actives will only raycast each other rather than worrying about anything else in 3JS, which actually I don't think anything else Everything in this version of 3JS is, uh, or is in this app, is a texture active. So, 
Here's the color picker. And it's a panel, so that's a little bit different. In this one, we did the geometry, the material, and the mesh, and then did the add mesh. With a make panel, all of that stuff gets done for us. So this is the three helper mod module, uh, make panel. We pass in some things that we want there, including that this is the texture actives and the texture active is colors. So this is the color picker texture active and we wanna add that to the panel. So that will do a plane geometry for us. It will figure out the size based on that scale. We've passed in, make it double-sided as well so that as we look at it from either side, it's double-sided. And we, yeah, and that will automatically as well add it to texture actives and figure out that the texture actives is on that layer and assign it that layer as well. So nice and short there to make a panel. We moved it down in the browser world and we added it to the scene. Yay. And in VR, that ends up getting moved to the left hand and scaled and positioned and rotated. Here's the title, basically the same thing. <clears throat> uh, why do we need to get to a true there? Double-sided. So these are other parameters we don't need and that's double-sided. Here's the body. It's a sphere. And we are, there's the texture right there, which is the avatars canvas. So this is the texture active object. It's canvas, gets added to the body texture, which is a canvas texture. And then we map that body texture onto the material. And then we mesh that to the, the sphere. But we also have to, because it's not just to make panel like that, we have to remember to add it to the texture actives. We're adding the body and we're putting it on layer one. Other bodies. All right. So uh, one last thing, though, this room. Here's the room. I don't think there's anything interesting about the room, really. Uh, it's a big box. It has a backing canvas, like a canvas texture, a texture active. That's a texture active right there. It's canvas. And we're putting that on all four sides, but not on the top and the bottom. We're then meshing that, adding it to the room, and also adding it to texture actives on layer one. Okay, so that's the big room that we're sitting in. And our final thing, because that's the end of the socket, and the end of the frame, our final thing here <laughs> is um, we need to know, so we've just arrived, what other bodies already exist. So what we're doing is we're looping through socket.get properties for the avatar. And if you recall, anytime somebody's in VR, they make an avatar, it tells the ID of that avatar in this location. So basically that's an array of everybody's ID who has an avatar. We collect that as avatar, so that's gonna be the ID. If it's not undefined, oh, we don't need to do that anymore. Let's see, I don't think that. Oh, I'm just trying to think. When people leave the room, it removes the data. So when people leave the room, it will remove the data from the get properties of avatars. So, uh, so that would be handled for us. We would have needed that if they didn't really leave the room, but they just removed their avatar because they came out of VR and stayed in the browser. But we took that away, so I don't think we need that anymore. Although it doesn't do any harm, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, what do you think? Let's see. If they leave the room, it's not going to leave an undefined in the avatar list. No, I think that should be fine. So basically we're saying, hey, when when you arrive, everybody who's got an avatar currently, make another avatar for them. It comes up and does this stuff. Right here, make other avatar. 
So it gets the, all the data for that avatar. It gets the current data, which is the skin, the stripe, and the X and Y down below here. It makes a texture active for each of those avatars. It adds the texture active to the texture actives. It makes 3JS stuff. That's why we put the loop down below, because for us to make this mesh right here of the body geometry and the body material in this function, we can only run that function after we've got a body geometry. So we put that loop after we have a body geometry. Okay, that's why it's way down here, because to make those bodies has to. The other place we make these are when people come in later, you know. So that the, if a new person comes in, we also have to make them an avatar. But we're obviously in VR, or we're like in here already. We've already got the. We're not necessarily in VR, but we've already got a body geometry made in here and stuff. So we're good. All right. I think that was it. Uh, did you catch that? Uh, I don't know if I've completed what was in that function again, but we'd already seen it. So uh, it makes a body. Oh yeah, I didn't finish it. It um, adds that body to the texture actives. So this is the mesh. Adds the mesh to the texture actives. Adds that to the scene. And sets the various um, settings on it. And if we're not in VR, then it has to move certain things back. <clears throat> So there you go. That was it. Oh my God. We did it. An hour and a half. I mean, we've had longer uh, Zim Explorers, but this was quite the Zim Explorer, wasn't it? And you're welcome to come in, ask any questions. If something in here didn't make sense, you're always welcome to watch it again as well. Of course, everything I say makes sense all the time, <laughs> unless I say it wrong. And come in and join us at zimjs.com slash slack, zimjs.com slash discord. We would love to see you there. This has been a Zim Explorer. I'm Dr. Abstract. Cheers.